Hi, I'm Claudia Durastanti, and I wrote a book called La Straniera, which is currently being translated into English by the lady uh, next to me. And this book is going to be published by Riverhead in the US, Fitzgerald in the UK, and Text in Australia. And La Straniera, if that makes any sense, is a sort of nonfiction novel. Uh, I like to consider it also uh, an adventure tale uh, told uh, through personal essays. Uh, and it's the story of my family. It focuses a lot, especially on my deaf parents. And it's a story of family told through the perspective of deafness on the one hand and migration on the other hand. And migration in particular that took my grandparents, my mother, and then myself from a very small town in southern Italy. Uh, from a region called Basilicata to New York City. Uh, this going back and forth, uh, which was very erratic and uh, random in many cases, uh, between what I used to call the future and the past started in the 60s and of course has uh, many reverberations on my life and still makes uh, has consequences, of course, uh, that, that I discuss in the book. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to, to, to Liz to discuss the title. Yes, um, uh, my name is Liz Harris, um, and the um, the title of this book um, is La Straniera, which is feminine. Um, the masculine, which is supposedly like the standard of the word, um, is lo straniero, um, which means foreigner. It also means outsider. Um, it also means uh, the stranger, which of course echoes for us with um, with Camus, the stranger. And the book definitely uh, resonates um, off of that title. Um, the issue with the title, though, is that this is female, um, and that that that's very important for the book. It relates both to Claudia and also to to her mother. Um, it, as Claudia has has said, the it, the uh, the journeys are 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 female driven, um, and we don't feel that we can get rid of the the quality of, um, of of the female in our title. So we're still working on that. We have to figure out that title, um, and Claudia will continue now. Uh, yes. Uh, as Liz said, all, all the migrations in this book are, are, are in this book are activated by women. So if we lose the, the gendered component, uh, it would be a, a great uh, loss, uh, and we'll find our way around it. I wanted to read a passage in Italian. I think it's nice if you could hear how it sounds in its original form. I mean, this passage, for me, kind of condenses the whole sense uh, of the book. La storia di una famiglia somiglia più a una cattiva topografica che a un romanzo. È una biografia, è la somma di tutte le ere geologiche che hai attraversato. Scrivere te stessa significa ricordare che sei nata con rabbia e sei stata una colata lavica densa e continua, prima che la tua crosta si indurisse e si spaccasse per lasciare affiorare una specie di amore o che la forza inutile del perdono venisse a levigarti e ad appiattire ogni tuo avvallamento. Here's the English of what Claudia just read. The story of a family is more like a map than a novel, and a biography is the summation of all the geologic ages you've passed through. Writing yourself means remembering that you were born with rage, that you were thick, steady, flowing lava before your crust hardened and cracked and allowed some sort of love to emerge or that useless power of forgiveness came and smoothed you over, leveling out all your hollows. Rereading yourself means inventing what you've gone through, identifying each layer you're built upon. The crystals of joy or loneliness beneath, the result of some evaporated memory, everything that's been carved out, down flooded, only for you to realize that time's not healing after all. There is a breach that can be filled. The only thing time will do is carry dust and weeds along with it, 
until that crevice is covered over and transformed to a different landscape, distant, almost a fairy tale, where you no longer recognize the language spoken that could just as well be elvish. You cross the ruins of your family and realize that some words have been erased, but others have been saved. Some have disappeared while others will always be a part of your reverberation until finally you arrive at the edge, at your father and your mother, after years of believing that dying or going mad was the only way to live up to them. And then you realize that everything in your blood is beckoning and you're just an echo of a past mythology. So this last word, mythology, is central to, to La Straniera. Um, since the book is divided in five chapters that kind of mirror uh, the, the voices in horoscopes. Uh, so the chapters are love, money, health, travels, and mythology. And this is due to the peculiar obsession my mom has with horoscopes. My mom, uh, and this is very common amongst uh, the, the deaf community, yeah. has some issues uh, or even uh, hostility sometimes for a figurative language, symbols, metaphors, allegories. My mom likes nonfiction books. She has a hard time with fiction. And to her, the meaning has always to match uh, reality in a way. Uh, so I made my way, you know, my writing is kind of the opposite. What I love literature is the exact opposite of what I expect from text that what my mother does. She's interested in the truth and I'm more interested in falsehood and ambiguity. Uh, and so I think I was very influenced by her way of being obsessed for, uh, of biographies in a way by refusing to, to write a biography my whole lifetime. And then I found... Uh, a way, thanks to my parents, to and the way they are, they kind of are used to tell their own life to uh, blend what's real and what not, and uh, to to play with the elements of mythology that are in every family, and uh, to, to to treat the, uh, the story of a family more than like a map than a novel itself. So we are going to read the opening of the book. Um, this section is called Mythology. My mother and I met the day he tried to jump off the sister bridge in Trastevere. It was a good place to jump. He was a fine swimmer, but once he hit the water, he'd be paralyzed. And the Tiber back then was already toxic and green. My mother always walked like it was raining, head down, shoulders hunched, especially when she was alone. But that day, she stopped on the bridge and saw a boy straddling the parapet wall. She came closer, laid her hand on his shoulder to pull him back. Maybe they scuffled. She persuaded him to come down, breathe slowly. Then they took a walk through the city, got drunk, and went up at a hotel with sleep sheets and sink of ammonia. Before dawn, my mother put her clothes on and left. She had to get back to her boarding school, and my father seemed so restless. She didn't even shake his shoulder to let him know she was going. The next day, she stepped outside of school with her girlfriends and saw him leaning against someone's car, his arms crossed. And right then, she knew she was doomed. I've always envied her mystical, woeful expression when she spoke of him. I've always been jealous of that apocalypse. That day in front of her school, my father wore tapered jeans, a blue shirt with the sleeves rolled up, and he was smoking a Marlboro Red. He a day. He'd come to pick up in front of the State Institute of Vienna Mentana, and that's when their life together began. How did he manage to find me, she'd say. When I was little, and she told me this, he transformed my father into a serious wizard who could capture us anytime, anywhere. And I hugged her tight and didn't answer and wondered what it was like to be desired that way by a man. Then I grew up, started pointing out the obvious. There was only one school for people like you in Rome, so it couldn't have been all that hard. She nod, then shake her head. He found her because he had to. Though their marriage ended, she never regretted pulling him off that bridge. He was deaf, like her, and their relationship held something closer, something deeper than love. 
My father and mother met the day he tried to save her from an assault in front of the Dristevede station. He'd stopped to buy cigarettes and was about to get back in his car when he noticed the sudden erratic movements of two thieves. They were kicking a girl, trying to yank away her purse. After he threatened them and scared them off, he stopped to help my mother and persuaded her to go back home with him to wash up. He was still living with his parents. When they saw that girl, barely out of her teens, her dark skin, her hair wet from the shower, they thought she was an orphan. At age 20, my mother had a wide body smile, a smoker's teeth, straight black hair to her shoulders, not a good look on anyone. Sometimes she pulled her hair back with a tortoiseshell barrette. She lived in a boarding school, but often stayed out at night. She studied sporadically. She took small jobs to supplement what her parents sent from America, but she didn't show up to work on time. From that day he appeared, they started going out. They spoke the same language composed of gasps and words pronounced too loudly, but it was their behavior that drew looks on the street. They shoved past people as they walked, not turning to apologize, exuding difference. He had light brown hair, full lips, aristocratic features. She barely came to his shoulder and seemed to have stepped out of some jungle gorilla squad. Back then, my father was able to pop up out of nowhere, often when she'd be leaving to see her family in America or disappearing for a few days, or much later when they'd separated and he showed up at the departure's terminal at the exact right moment, or else appeared behind a glass door or stepped off an elevator or slammed the car door so she'd look up a moment. She recognized him from his slouched posture, the flicker of his cigarette. He'd find her like a wounded, bleeding hunter looking for his prey when he has no other senses to rely on and must trust his own raging instincts. My father and mother divorced in 1990. They've seen each other only a few times since, but both will start their story off by saying they saved the other's life. Thanks, Liz, for reading that. I I'm a oh. translator myself so there's a lot of empathy and understanding going uh through this process and i wanted to thank your dog <laughs> mr darcy for being <laughs> for working. thank you darcy <laughs> and, uh, thanks everyone for for listening yeah thank you everyone thank you claudia bye, bye everybody bye, -bye.